This hourly segment is brought to you by IDT. Eliminate paper files with the IoT Smart Connected Scanning Device. Find them at ready, the number four, IDT.com. Now, from the Signature Bank Studios, this is Chicago's Morning Answer with Dan Proft and Amy Jacobson on AM560, The Answer. Top of the morning, Dan and Amy. I definitely want to talk more about uh, my boy dog, Hemhoff. His <laughs> mad skills uh, and uh, those uh, those phone calls uh, that were made from Mamala and oh. Dog to uh, Tim and Gwen because we were so fortunate that someone was able to capture them so we could all share oh, in yeah. those moments. Uh-huh. Um, so I do want to talk a little bit more about those, but we have to also be a little bit sober in these precarious economic times. Uh, Kyle Bass is a hedge fund manager and he gave uh, a really frank and uh, honest uh, dissertation on uh, the manipulation by the Fed and the politics that informs uh, those manipulations, the easy money and the reckoning that's uh, that uh, appears to have started to come in Friday and Monday, but the anticipation There'll be more manipulations to prevent a true reckoning, at least between now and Election Day. And that's why Kyle Bass, hedge fund manager on CNBC, laying it straight on the politics of easy money and the prospect of interest rates cuts. Take a listen. Late last year, um, you saw that you saw the way the government funds itself go from bonds to bills. And I know that that sounds like an arcane idea, but what that did is it released another two trillion ish of of liquidity into the market going into the elections. And one can think that these bodies are apolitical, but I can tell you that uh, knowing what's gone on behind the scenes, I can tell you that there have been some political currents going on there. And, and therefore, now the cries for uh, intermediate cuts are coming. Remember, back in uh, 2000, Greenspan in mid-December announced that he was probably going to cut uh, at their January meeting, and it forced him to cut 50 basis points into meeting on January 3rd, 2001. So that even if the Fed's not intending to cut, here's what happens. They, they say they don't care about the stock market, but every time one of them talks on television, they go watch what the stock market does as a result of them talking. Uh, and so if, if the stock market rolls over and high end consumption collapses, which is likely to happen, uh, then you have the whole economy rolling over because it's high end consumption holding the economy up. Uh, and you know that will that would make the Harris win less likely. So I think you can expect some aggressive Fed cutting between now and the November election. Um, I mean, there, there's the political component that most of these uh, investotainment pundits don't want to say, which is what you just heard. The, the, the liquidity that they infuse in the market is drying up. Uh, the stock market rolls over, predicated on high-end consumption. Then the whole economy rolls over. The whole economy rolls over. Then uh, the rent seekers on Wall Street and the permanent political class in D.C. don't get what they want, which is a Trump defeat. Uh, and this is somebody, you know, again, hedge fund manager Kyle Bass, big hedge fund, sophisticated guy. He knows what time it is. It's just he's, and so do a lot of other people, he's just one of the few that's willing to lay it straight. For more on this and other matters, political and economic, please be joined by Morgan Marietta, who's the Dean of Economics, Politics, and History at the uh, University of Austin in Austin, Texas, which is uh, welcoming its uh, first freshman class uh, here this fall, like right now. Uh, Morgan Marietta, thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate it. Dan, thanks for uh, having me on. It's a pleasure to talk to you right now at the university opening up. And- so much going on right now. Not sure exactly what you want to talk about, but there's a <laughs> there's a lot to talk about. Well, let, let's start there with, uh, with what uh, is anti- what what occurred on Friday and Monday, what it signals, and what the market is anticipating, and why they're likely to get what they're anticipating, as Kyle Bass was just explaining. Oh, you mean in terms of the uh, Japanese stock market going down and the reaction in U.S. markets? That uh, I think he's right that there's a tremendous amount of pressure to keep the economy humming. We don't understand elections anymore. I think that's one of the great themes in academics right now. 
among political science people, we're essentially admitting that elections have changed so much that we don't really know how to predict them. We don't really know how to understand them. But the traditional way of understanding it is that it really deeply depends on the state of the economy. And right now we're in that middle range. It's not terrible in the sense of a recession. It's not obviously good. So the last thing that people who have a stake in Trump losing and uh, Harris winning want is the stock market to correct right now. What what do you think, just on the the top, since you brought up the the predictive modeling, which we have uh, grown to appreciate so much uh, coming out of COVID, uh, predictive modeling with respect to elections, though, and all the play this uh, poli-sci professor Alan Lickman gets for his, you know, 13 indicators of who's going to win because the 13 indicators have proven 90 percent accurate or something like this. But a lot of those indicators are somewhat subjective and easily manipulable. I mean, this is social science after all. Um, but but essentially, he is suggests that, you know, most of the indicators are going Kamala's way and some of the wild cards include war and uh, an economic downturn. But h- how much how much stock do you put in uh, that those predictive models and as, as opposed to just sort of looking and say, yeah, well, sure. I mean, obvious things. If the economy is uh, is, is in free fall or if we're entangled in war then that's going to redound to the, uh, the to the detriment of the incumbent. I mean, this is not a rocket science. Yeah, I think that's right. I think the old models simply don't work anymore. They are grounded, especially those historical models are grounded in pretty obvious considerations that if there's a scandal going on, if there's war going on, if there's recession going on, uh, how easily the incumbent uh, got the renomination, if there were a challenge or not, things of that nature. But no, I really don't think that's actually what's going on anymore. All of that assumed that there were legitimate information flows and that people really could see and understand what was going on. It assumed that we weren't deeply polarized to the point that actual information couldn't get to people. And it assumed that we had some degree of confidence in each of the candidates. But it wasn't looking at the current world where information is so radically distorted. Uh, People feel that they have this duty to pretend and lie about certain things and tell the lies of their group and go along with things uh, that they wouldn't have in the past. So things could be corrected. Uh, But that's almost impossible right now. So, no, no, I don't think we understand it anymore at all. Uh, one thing I wanted to say about the Wall Street, that uh, people uh, used to think that you had to balance a ticket. One of the really interesting things about what just happened is neither party thought they had to balance the ticket. Trump's pick was very much a populist one that was reinforcing his message, not trying to seek any kind of ideological or regional balance. And uh, Kamala Harris's pick is very much not trying to seek balance. She's not reaching out in any way. She's doubling down on a very progressive and woke approach. So what's odd is that both of them think they can win without balancing and playing to their base. Well, these are these. I mean, this just started a, a while back, arguably. Um, but I mean, the, the 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 idea or the phraseology is base plus elections. Right. So it's it's yeah. ba- base plus enthusiasm gets me across the line. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. And the problem with all of the modeling We can't actually predict the enthusiasm. That is fully in the judgment part. It's not really art. It's uh, judgment. And one of the great problems with the models is when you see these uh, polls and the election predictors, they're grounded in certain assumptions about what the turnout is going to look like, how big it is, and within certain demographic groups. And most of them won't tell you what the modeling is, and that's why we see these differences in them. They're making different assumptions about what the turnout rates are going to be. But it's not science. In the sense, science is when you have open and honest conversation that people can weigh in on and correct, and it's a group endeavor. That is exactly what is not going on. They're not telling us what their assumptions are. I think it's and so, because we don't know anything, we can't really tell. Yeah, I think it's interesting that the, the points you make too about sort of the information flow. I mean, it, there was always gatekeepers to information, um, but but um, but p- perhaps not so fragmented and, uh, and 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 not so many fragments committed to propagandizing on issues as as in the past. Um, the the it's the idea of at least even if you're trying, even if you have your finger on the scale for for one side. 
is you're going to give something approximating a fair airing to both. And that's just by the wayside. But but it um, so how does how does that manifest itself in terms of uh, assessing, for example, um, of the controversy that followed Trump's comments at that uh, convention for black journalists where you even have you, you even have Victor Davis Hanson, Victor Davis Hanson saying, you know, Trump's path to victory is by focusing on the issues. He used the comparison of George Herbert Walker Bush uh making up a 17 point deficit on Michael Dukakis in 1988 by just talking about essentially how left his record was as governor of Massachusetts Dukakis is. But my sense is, and I'm, I'm hesitant to question the great VDH, but my sense is, you know, 1988 is not 2024 and just focusing on, she said in this case, she said this on immigration. She did this on border security. Look at the uh, the border. She said this on fracking for Pennsylvania voters and, and Ohio voters and so forth. My sense is, is actually that's not enough, that it is very personal in a way. Maybe it wasn't as much 35 years ago in 1988. And to uh, address the visceral issues like our tribalism is to uh, really be in a conversation that people are otherwise having and frankly want to have in lieu of deep dives on some of these policy issues that are more complicated. Yeah, Dan, it is not 1988. In uh, 1988, the great image was Michael Dukakis in the tank. And you remember this, right? There was that sure. video of him looking very small and weak, and he looked like he obviously couldn't be a commander in chief. And the way I was taught elections is that people who study it pay attention to it, so they think everybody else pays attention to it. But that's fundamentally not true. Most people catch the meaning of the election in snippets. And that was a snippet that came through, and everybody saw it, and it gave them this feeling and this impression. That worked in 1988. That will not work now for one very simple reason. Everybody won't see it because there's no honesty in the presentation in media. So if something is not useful to one side, they simply will memory hold it and not present it, to the point that people on the right, if it's not useful to the right, will not even know about it. And especially on the left, people on the left literally won't know. So uh, one really good example in the current day is about Kamala Harris being the border czar. That is actually being pushed aside by control of social media and control of narrative to the point that a lot of people simply don't know that. Or if it's brought to their attention, they'll say, no, no, I heard that wasn't true. I heard that was a lie. Right. So you right. can't bring things to people's attention in the way that you used to. So no, I don't think that's right. One of the, the, the deep problems in our society, I've been thinking a lot about this recently, that um, there's this political science professor, this guy named Wilfred Riley, yeah. Uh, I think he's really brilliant. Yeah, Kentucky and he has State. This phrase. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, brilliant, brilliant guy. And he has this phrase that uh, in our, it's the culture that has changed. And we now have in the culture what he calls a duty to pretend. That people feel that even though they know something isn't true, they know what they're supposed to say. There's mm -hmm. a duty to pretend. There's a duty to pretend that that man is a woman. There's a duty to pretend that the person who's an affirmative action hire, even if you were in the room and you know they were chosen for race or gender, you know there's a duty to pretend that they were the best person for the job. Third example is about Joe Biden. And that was shocking to me because people who were really willing to look at reality and speak about reality – they knew that he was fading and had mental difficulties years ago. This was not news to anyone. So the great shock to me was that it suddenly was actually normal to say it. And it was that great moment where it became so obvious to everyone that it was personally embarrassing to follow the duty to pretend. But you remember that a lot of people held on to it even then. There were a quarter of reporters were still trying to throw down because they thought they still had that duty. And in a situation like that, things are so uh, corrupt in information that, no, no, the, the normal things of elections, the, the knowledge won't get out in the way that it would have in 1988. Yeah, and, and I, you know, that the duty to protect, that same thing is happening with the Trump uh, failed assassination attempt. 
I mean, now, now yeah, that that, yeah. now, that got so much notoriety, it, it was hard not to see it. But, I mean, I've seen some swing state polling right now. So, so the uh, uh, recently I've seen some swing state polling, uh, you know, a um, uh, conglomeration of the seven, seven swing states and where things stand. And on the question of more or less likely to vote for Trump uh, because he survived that assassination attempt, you know, a super majority of voters uh, say it doesn't matter. And I, I'm not saying I'm not saying he, it should matter in terms of who you think is the best person for the job. But it's just one of those things where it has been sort of, you know, that moment would be iconic in a different era. And now because you're so, as you say, duty to, in this case, hate Trump and everything about Trump, be suspicious, conspiracy theories about Trump staging that a failed assassination attempt and so forth, that you're immediately suspicious, you're immediately sort of trained, half the country is, to discount it as a particularly important moment. Um, even so much to say, um, you know, I, the, the left, you know, allies with agencies that they normally were properly fearful of in terms of their power, the FBI and federal law enforcement, spy agencies, even the Secret Service. So that, that duty to pretend also extends even to those moments, I think. Have you noticed how normal it has become to question whether that actually happened? Yeah. Right. Yeah, it, so. it, it's shocking, really, that uh, something that in the previous era that we're talking about, 88 or even in 2000, 2005, you couldn't do that. The, the idea that it was reasonable discourse to question publicly, deeply known and reported realities, it just wouldn't have been there. But, but now it is. Yeah, uh, two quick thoughts on that. The first one is that if this had been ordinary times or that had been, say, President Obama, for example, that photo would be iconic. It uh, would be everywhere. It would have been on every uh, magazine cover. Uh, it would continue to be so. It would be um, ubiquitous, unavoidable. Uh, and what's happening is now the opposite. And you have to ask why that is going on. I wanted to bring up the, the second point on this that we've spoken before and on the podcast you had me talking about the Supreme Court. The one, so many things happened to the Supreme Court this year that the ones on social media and free speech just simply didn't get a lot of play. And in a year that a lot of the cases went the right way on the Supreme Court, uh, these went the wrong way. And these are the ones about whether the Biden administration – interfered in the social media flows on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all these ways people now get their information and define themselves. And the Supreme Court uh, took a very strange, almost a duty to pretend themselves that it didn't happen. It would have been controversial for them to recognize the realities that were very clearly demonstrated mm -hmm. that the administration did in fact pressure Social media companies, they did in fact intervene. They have the emails, they have their seats and the documents. But they didn't want to say that that had really happened. And they also didn't want to, I think, speak honestly about social media in the sense that, uh, and this is an, a little bit of an honest debate, that whether social media companies have become a truly public forum, and this has to do uh, with these doctrines about utility companies that uh, whether they have become imbued with a public purpose is the legal phrase, and whether they actually have become so dominant and important that you can't exclude from them. The similar debate is about uh, railways back in the day or uh, phone lines back in the day. It got to the point that if railroads could cut a deal with Company A and exclude Company B, they could destroy a Company B. So we intervened at that point. And the same thing was true with utility companies. You can't deny somebody electric service or you can't deny somebody phone service if you don't like their ideology. And we're still treating social media companies like they're just simply private companies and can do whatever they want. So they have their free speech actors rather than free speech forums. And the real truth is that that has shifted. They're so important that when states tried to regulate them just a bit and say that they couldn't deny conservatives or they couldn't actually shadow ban people on the right but not on the left, Supreme Court uh, didn't intervene, and they let that one go. It's actually one of the most important battles of all of American politics now 
because it's at the heart. People get their information through social media, and social media have become horrifyingly controlled and biased. And uh, until we have a Supreme Court that's willing to fix that and address it uh, in an honest way, uh, that's one of the real roots of these problems that we're talking about. Morgan Marietta, the Dean of Economics, Politics, and History at the University of Austin, their freshman class, their first freshman class this fall. Uh, By the way, as he mentioned, uh, we did a deep dive on the Supreme Court this last term and the important decisions, including the Murthy v. Missouri decision he was referencing. You can get that at American Greatness, amgreatness.com. Morgan Marietta, thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate it. Yeah, Dan, thanks so much. And uh, just the last plug, if uh, students who are going to college are interested in an environment of actual free inquiry and actual civil discourse where people can really speak their mind and change their mind, uh, consider the University of Austin. Amen to that. Thanks, Morgan. All right, coming up at 8.38, uh, we'll turn our attention to uh, the finance side of the New York Times. She has a new book on Bill Gates. Oh, this could be very interesting. Her new book, Billionaire Nerd, Savior King, Bill Gates and His Quest to Shape Our World. Hmm. Uh, That's at 8.38. But now let's head into the newsroom. Here's Mike Scott. Outside, we have sunshine in Chicago. 67 degrees at 831. Kamala Harris on a campaign tour of battleground states with her new running mate, Tim Walls. The Minnesota governor appeared alongside Harris for the ticket's first joint rally in Philadelphia Tuesday, heading to Wisconsin and Michigan today. Former president and GOP presidential nominee Donald Trump joined Fox and Friends this morning 